Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to today's History Hack. Now, this is another one masterminded by Mrs. Charlotte White. You might be surprised as to where she's dropped down in history because it is not in the land of big curly wigs and frills, is it? No, I have wandered. I've wandered from the 17th century. Uh, to go a little bit later, but if there's one thing that makes me stray, it's fashion. Because you know me, Alex, I like a frock. I do. And we've also got Carolyn Lurkin as well. She's refusing to say anything, but as a fashion historian. So this room is full of people. I am the only one who's not a fashionista, but I'm going <laughs> to sit and watch you guys nerd out massively. Welcome, Kate. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can, You maybe we'll um, convert you by the end. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> do you want to go back and do the, the thing and then we can switch that around in the edit? Yeah, of course. Um, We're really lucky to have with us today Kate Strasden, who's a lecturer in cultural studies at Falmouth University and a consultant for dress and textile exhibitions, the kind of places where Carolyn and I very much hang out. She's here today to tell us all about the dress diary of Mrs. Anne Sykes, her latest book, and the result of six years hard sleuthing. Hi, Kate. Hello, thank you for having me. It's really lovely to be here. Um, yeah, always happy to to talk about the sleuthing of the dress diary. So what what is a dress diary, Kate? Um, how did Anne Sykes enter your life? I kind of gave it the name of a dress diary loosely because it's a really rare object and I didn't really know what, what else to call it. So I've given it that name, but it's not an, a kind of official name by any means. Back in 2016 I was attending a lace class regularly I make I make bobbin lace honiton lace and after one of the group meetings that we'd had once a month so it was this session it was actually a brilliant um session for women uh, and they were all much older than me so I was the youngest there by a long way and one of the ladies after the class knew what my job was and she said that she had got things she needed to clear from her apartment and would I like to come down So I had this kind of magical afternoon with her where she was just clearing. She had she had so much stuff that she had amassed over the years. She was um, she had worked in the London theatre world as a wardrobe mistress and so had just got stacks of stuff, uh, dress patterns, haberdashery stuff from the Edwardian period, just loads and loads of things. And then right at the very bottom of the um it was a trunk at the bottom of her bed she cleared everything else out and then there was this parcel that was wrapped up in brown paper and she'd forgotten all about it and um as soon as I unwrapped it it was you could see it was going to be something really special because it was bulging so it was a book an album that had started out very narrow the spine end had once upon a time been really very much narrower and then it turned into this bulky, really bulging kind of volume that was clearly full of stuff. And the stuff turned out to be fabric swatches. So I guess to start the story, I just can't tell you how excited Carolyn looks at the idea of ferreting for a trunk and finding something like that. Um, and she's going to want to talk to you later about how much other swag you made off with from that clear out. But let's start with who is Anne Sykes then? Um, and she she has a husband as well, Adam. She does. Uh, I started to transcribe because above each of these swatches, there was uh, a caption, handwritten caption, not very much detail. And that's why I kind of loosely call it a diary, because it doesn't really, apart from the fact that it's broadly chronological by year, it doesn't give a lot away. So I managed to discover eventually that the keeper of this was a woman called Anne Sykes. Uh, She just mentioned herself once in one swatch that it was a dress I wore and 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 that was the only time she actually identified herself. So she was a young woman who had grown up in Tilsley in Lancashire. She was the daughter of a mill owner and uh, 
She then in 1838 married a man called Adam. Don't know how they came to meet or anything like that, what the, what the, the connection there was. So she married Adam in September 1838. And this book kind of charts their life together, really, because it includes him, but it also includes over 100 names of different, mostly women, that kind of she encountered through her life. Anne and her family are involved in the cloth industry, and cotton itself provides Anne with a very comfortable life. But it's perhaps worth taking a moment, and you do this in the book, to remember where that cotton came from, even in the north of England. Yeah, exactly. It was it, her father, James Burton, owned four cotton mills. And at this time, uh, they lived quite close to Manchester, which was known as Cottonopolis. It was a kind of monstrous industry that just had to be fed. And there was no, the demand for cotton had just grown exponentially over the course of the, from the beginning of the 19th century onwards. And so the millions of bales that were coming into Liverpool could only be sourced from one place at that time, and that was the Southern States of America. And of course, uh, the abolition, the the final abolition of of the enslaved, didn't happen in America until um, later on, until about the early eighteen sixties. And that meant that all of the cotton that Ab, that Anne's father would have been sourcing would have come from, would have been picked by by the hands of of enslaved people. And and that's. You know, that's what uh, it was a, a kind of stark reality to think about when I was looking through the pages of the book. Can you tell us, Clark's Shoes, they supported the abolitionist movement, didn't they? They did. What was really interesting was that there was a small group, and it was a fairly small group, but it but vocal of Quaker families in the UK, including Clark's, which were a Quaker, they were a Quaker family in, in Somerset. And these women were very vocal in trying to promote the free labour cotton movement. So they were sourcing from parts of America that were making cotton with uh, without enslaved labour, uh, but it was it was a very small amount. However, they were very good at sourcing it, bringing it back to the UK, and then selling it at a very reasonable amount. They didn't, given given that there wasn't very much of it, they sold it for quite a reasonable. Uh, amount to make it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. That's not interesting. So it's it's almost like ethical fair trade shopping. Exactly, exactly. It was a, it was a kind of forerunner of of that kind of thinking. And um, they did start to get some. They did get some press. You know, they were they were setting up. So one of the women set up a stall in her in the town of Street, which is where the Clark shoes were based. And she would have a, a little sort of almost like a shop front where she would go as often as she could to encourage people to come and buy from her. So they did receive uh, increasing amounts of coverage to try it. And if, if nothing else, it was starting to raise awareness, I think. Fantastic. This all feeds into into the story that you create around Anne Sykes and, and this diary. Um, other than her husband, Anne's brother Edward is the only man who features in the dress diary. So what was it about Edward that made him diary worthy? Anne had four other brothers, so she could have chosen from any number. And I think <laughs> the reason she probably chose Edward was that the swatches included that bear his name have, are all really bright colours. So I wonder if the others were just maybe a bit dull. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, a time where menswear has changed a lot from the previous century. And so you do have Adam seems to wear quite bright vests or waistcoats. And she includes some of those and his dressing gowns and some of the brighter uh, colours. But I think probably for the more sober suiting cloths that would have been black or, or dark green or dark browns those kinds of shades I just don't think she was that interested in including them so Edward I think perhaps was a snappy dresser and that's why that warranted his his inclusion what was your I'm going to stick a question in here because then it teased Charlie up to ask a question that she should really ask in a minute what's the <laughs> what was the thing that you liked most that you found in the, what's your favorite item that she's stuck in the diary um 
the oh it's really difficult the the pirate flag and i know it you know this is a this is a crazy swatch because it it kind of at this point i wasn't sure how it featured in the diary that there, there's just a, a swatch of red flannel at the top of or red wool at the top of one of the pages and it's on the same page as a pair of adam's birthday slippers so it's <laughs> it's a kind of mad juxtaposition of of international daring do and domestic comfort um so th- i think that was the swatch that kind of stopped me in my tracks really oh we've got to ask you we can't we can't leave the pirate question hanging how how on earth what does on that, earth i know a victorian lady of you know, some means how does she end up fraternizing with pirates well, because Anne and Adam moved to Singapore in the eighteenth, well, in eighteen forty, this was a point where Singapore was uh, a, had a, a small European merchant community, but the merchant trade itself was very lucrative, and pirate vessels coming out from the Malay, uh, various of the Malay uh, regions, would swoop down at certain times of year and and pillage the merchant vessels. And the red flag is actually really horrifying because it means um, no quarter given. The idea of a red flag is that there would be no mercy shown. So anybody who sees these huge rowing boats appearing with uh, flying the red flag, uh, it must have been a a really terrifying prospect. But Anne met uh, at some point, don't know when, uh, uh, Admiral Sir Thomas Cochrane who was in charge of anti-piracy duties in the region at the time. And there are newspaper accounts that talk about him coming into Singapore and attending social events. So at some point she collared him and managed to persuade him to part with a piece of a flag for her diary. Brilliant. It's just, it's amazing. It's just sort of nestled there amongst all the, the frills and the flounce and the lace and the, exactly. the beautiful prints. Bit of a pirate flag. Yeah. <laughs> have say, I have no interest in doing laundry. Charlie, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> so Alex has left me this question knowing that I, I believe my family to come from a very long line of washerwomen. Um, it's an in-joke for my mother and I because we both enjoy laundry a ridiculous amount. We really, we, we can't figure it out. It's a nice day. All we can talk about is whether we've hung our laundry out. It's deeply sad. So let's talk about laundry. Is it true that Victorian women washed their clothes far less than we do now? I think I think that's a, a, a kind of a trick question in a way, because it depends on what you're talking about in terms of cleaning. So linen, under linen and things like nightwear and things that were more easily launderable, they laundered very successfully. And it, that doesn't mean to say that it wasn't a great deal of effort. There was a a very complicated process you probably would have loved it would have taken all day um to, from start to finish from the the soaking if you look at mrs beaton uh you can find mrs copies of mrs beaton's domestic uh, household volumes online and the the complexity about the order in which you have to do those various processes of washing linen is, is really fascinating um but when it comes to the outer garments there were many recipes that they had to successfully keep things clean. So no, they're not washing. They're not. They're not washing garments in the same way that we might. But actually, they have very, quite sophisticated slash toxic recipes for spot cleaning, stain removal, odor removal. That I think speaks to a much more knowledgeable approach to both the materials themselves and knowing how these these kind of chemicals will work with them and then also how to maintain and manage them. Um, so, yes, it's uh, probably not as frequently, but in different ways and, and complex ways that we can't really imagine. So they wear a lot of, you know, in terms of the linen and the, the undergarments, if you like, basically anything in contact with the skin and sweat, and those those kind of things. Those would be washed yes, more often. Exactly, exactly. And it's the reason why you see uh, collars and cuffs and things like that, lace collars and cuffs, because they were removable and they could be more easily cleaned and then they could be stitched back on. So there's kind of smart ways of protecting the most fragile parts of your wardrobe and 
uh, and that includes, as you say, wearing linen next to the skin so that it 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 acts as that barrier to a body odor and the outer outer garment. Alex, you're going to love that section of the book. It tells you all about how to how to wash bits and pieces. You'll be a you'll yeah. be a laundry woman before you know it. Yeah, no thanks. And obviously, this this is goes over. Like, tell us about the scope in terms of how many years this covers, because it must chart changes in fashion and style. And what stood out for you in that? I think what it shows is that it, it starts in the late 1830s, although there are one or two swatches from earlier because she includes some things that belong to her mother. And But mainly it charts from when they got married in 1838 and it goes up to the mid 1870s, although her her kind of captions and her, the way that she stuck the pieces in the book, they became less careful in a way. It's almost like you could see you could see that she was getting older, the writing got bigger and she was perhaps less interested in keeping a full record of the in the diary but what it shows is that she maintained she was interested in clothes right the way through those many decades of change the fabrics that she includes the colors the patterns you can see that shift through very clearly through the decades and i think it shows that you know, I think often people think fashion, fashion only happens to people who are living in in sort of urban um, urban hubs. But you've got a group of women here who were living in what you might say is uh, provincial spaces, but they weren't provincial people at all. They were very interested in dress and, and kept right up to the minute with it all. Carolyn, do you have anything on early Victorian fashion you'd like to ask? So many questions. I'm just fascinated by this production in particular. Is there a, a fabric swatch that you talked about the pirate flag, but I'm really curious about sort of the, what is your favorite kind of pattern swatch that you kind of stumbled across? There's one printed cotton that I can only imagine. It's so crazy. It's like this, it's, I mean, it doesn't sound, it's not, I'm, it's not going to sound great when I describe it here, but it's, it's brown with green and gold colored patterning to it a, a printed cotton but in the craziest pattern and it, and even looking at this kind of five inch square piece you think that is mad um trying to then imagine it into a either a, a dress or a cloak or whatever it might have been I can only imagine what that would have looked like on as an entire garment and I think that's a theme for the whole book which is that you know we we kind of think of gray toned 19th century folk because of looking at photographs and things like that but here they are they are absolutely vibrant and and um yeah crazy patterns as it retains the color really well because it's been really a well yes because it's oh, been oh, that's the one <laughs> that's exactly the one um I mean it's just and there are others and you think that just looks like some of them look like they could have you know they're either 60s marameco patterns or you know, yeah they're really they I mean, like when you were describing through. that one, I was thinking of like I've seen pictures of the curtains my nan had in the seventies, and it was yeah, <laughs> it had got a, a whiff of that. Yeah. Um, but they they were they were very everything about it is colourful because they have been preserved in the pages and they've retained all of their all of their strength of colour. It's really lovely as well. Some of the characters that you see running through the diary. There's a there's a woman Charlotte Dugdale Sykes who. You go from infancy with her right through her adult life almost. Yeah, you do. And it's really, I think what it's that kind of incoming and outgoing flow of people. Sometimes you have people that appear just on a page and then they never appear again. And it's maybe someone she met really fleetingly. But then someone like Charlotte, Charlotte was her niece. It, it was her husband's, uh, her husband's brother's daughter. So she talks about garments that were worn to Charlotte's christening and then you have Charlotte after she's got married and what she's wearing as uh, a, a new uh, newly married woman what she wears as she gets older so yeah she's this kind of constant presence in the in the book and it's I love that that there are some as as in life now you know some people that we keep in our lives forever and some people that come and go and there's a real sense of that. 
How many pages are we talking in total? It sounds like it was massive. There's over 400 pages and there are more than 2,000 swatches. So it's 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 sizable. The only other volume that I have found in the UK that's similar is the, I'm sure Carolyn will know of um, Barbara Johnson's album in the V&A. Uh, she was an 18th century um, uh, unmarried woman who kept more for financial reasons. She kept swatches to record how much she was paying for cloth when she was buying it. And I think there are about a hundred and something swatches in that one. Uh, so, so yeah, 2000 in Anne Sykes is, and it's just, it's, it's a real treasure. Carolyn's bouncing up and down on the sofa. It's true. It's true. It's a, it's an amazing kind of survival and a particularly of this period, right? This is a period that particularly the 1840s that tend to be sort of dismissed and, mm. There's not as much survival and it's seen as very drab. Um, and when you look at that kind of patterned swatch that you just talked about, um, it really is kind of amazing to think how kind of bright in some ways even the browns are and sort of what kind of a stunning display that would have been. Mm. Yeah, you're right. I was I must admit, I I wouldn't have I've been been much more become much more interested in that decade since discovering these swatches and looking at all the particularly the printed cottons they are so uh, members of Anne's family were um worked in the calico printing industry as designers often and so that sense of hiring artists to work in these print works who were designing multi-layered patterns that were then being applied to to the fabric in these bright bright colors uh I'm yeah I'm a real 1840s kind of Anna Waver now. Oh, the two of you are going to be Same. besties. We're, we're going to be inseparable in the 1840s. So that's fine. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. And plus, you know, you're talking about a time before mass production of clothes. It's not like Anne Sykes could just, you know, nip into Primani and, and get herself a new frock whenever she wanted one. These were considered purchases. Mm. The cloth is picked and chosen, hence why she, you know, why she's able to do swatches because she's yes. got you know a little bit of leftover fabric but the thought of all these all these women populating an area all in completely different um colors and patterns yeah. and it, it must have been a riot it must have been and you do get a sense of personalities emerging actually um there's one lady called miss garnet who i just in the last few days someone has contacted me i didn't know who she was she's just a name in the book and i'd written in the book you know, she's someone that looks really bright. All of her swatches are just vibrant. And the patterns that she chose are really, really out there. And then someone's contacted me and said, oh, Martha Garnett was this. She was an unmarried um, friend of Anne Sykes. She kept a diary and Mrs. Sykes features in it. And she was a real live wire. She was a kind of the mad aunt that everybody wrote about. Um, so I already kind of got that from the book without even knowing who she was so yeah you do see personalities in dress hands up who's the mad on i thought everyone in this room pretty much yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's not all anglo-centric though is it and you've mentioned singapore already so they moved to singapore so tell us about the sartorial options available to her there is it the same process by which she gets her clothes and what does the diary tell you about her role in singapore while he was working they left in July 1840 and it took them four months to get there. Adam had been given a job heading up merchant operations for his firm. And so they, they lived there for seven years. And during that time, you do get a sense of how they were acquiring things. So sometimes things could be sent over, either overland or via the um, via the, the sailing ships that were coming in. On some of the pages, she writes, for example, all on this page via the J. Dugdale. And at until I knew exactly what was going on, I couldn't really fathom that. And then I found the shipping manifesto that that uh, talked about the John Dugdale, which was at one of the uh, vessels for the for the merchant trading routes. So some fabrics were coming in via the ships. There was also there's a chapter in the book that's about somebody called Miss Brennan, and Miss Brennan was basically a, a small wares. So she kept a small wares retail kind of outlet. She had come over in the 1840s with her brother, Richard, 
and set up this and I think it was quite entrepreneurial I think she would send for things from from wherever and have a selection of fabrics and trimmings and ribbons and all this kind of thing that that women could buy to then either update or or make something so she was yeah I think she was quite smart in recognizing a bit of a gap in the market there you described the diary at one point as being like a deconstructed friendship blanket which I think is a really really lovely um, lovely image what does the diary tell us about female friendship in the mid 1800s there's some really nice examples of there's a lot of things being given so cloth is given as a token of of um friendship and as a as a means of showing that you care about somebody there's also examples of of friends dressing alike as well so fanny taylor is somebody that Anne was obviously very close to she came to live with them in singapore i don't know who fanny is because as you can imagine when you search for fanny taylor in the census records you get about eight million hits Mm-hmm. and there's no, there was no other there wasn't any other you know often you need a date just to tie you down so whether it's a wedding date or at least a place or something and so she was kind of untraceable but other than the fact that she was was close to Anne and there are quite a few instances in the diary where Anne writes Anne's like some Fanny Taylor morning gowns um or neck ribbons or we got these from Miss Brennan Smallwares and you you get that sense of them buying things to wear at the same time as an expression of their friendship and it's a it's a really particularly because they were so far from home as well it feels like a kind of bonding moment that they're sharing this kind of material at a time where they're very far away from everybody else in their life and um, there's lots of instances of that in the in the diary generally. Do you think someone might get in touch with you and say, oh, yeah, hi, I know who Fanny Taylor is. She's got a diary as well. I can't, I'm just hoping there's so many. Um, well, one of the, so the lady that contacted me about Miss Garnet saying, oh, I know who that is. She found a diary entry that said, oh, we're going over to Mrs. Sykes' house to see her portrait. Thinking, oh, there's a portrait of her somewhere. Um, I've never seen it. But yes, I think there might well be what I'm hoping is that there'll be people that can identify Anne and Adam never had children and so there aren't any direct descendants that I'd been able to find but I'm hoping that maybe somewhere in amongst uh, all of this that it will ring a bell with somebody and they'll they'll whip out a photo of Anne and Adam which I'm sure is out there somewhere or some other kind of information so yeah fingers crossed. Oh, so they come back, don't they, to Lancashire following time in Singapore and Shanghai. And obviously fashion moves on. Um, but can you tell, are there, is there, have they changed in their tastes and um, that they're using in their clothing and their fabrics? Has their time in the East sort of impacted their personal taste, do you think? In a way, they, they returned to being um, very conventional, sartorially conventional anyway, certainly from the swatches that are there. So. So, for example, in Singapore, Anne had this amazing leopard print furniture covers that she included this swatch of of, um, leopard, like glazed cotton that had a leopard print pattern. And she teamed that with a bright cerise damask curtain. So the the combined impact of that must have been quite something. When she (laughs) moves back to Lancashire and they moved to a place called Colthurst Hall, which is this lovely... A house that looks down the Ribble Valley and the interior fabric that she included for that is very conventional sort of rose print chintzy so I wonder if they they kind of were bound by convention when they when they got back to Singapore uh, when they got back to Lancashire rather and Adam describes himself in the 1861 census as a gentleman so he's no longer a merchant he's described himself as a gentleman and he's definitely sort of made his way in the world so it's almost like they are uh, they remain quietly conventional I think by the time they get back still fashionable and you see that throughout the 1850s and 60s but um, there's no more leopard print furniture in her life at that point it's like it's up there on a par with my mum's flamingo obsession it sounds like that sounds like quite a horrific combo it, it was a pretty big combo yeah um I'm not sure perhaps it perhaps it when you've got the sun streaming in in Singapore but I don't think it would have cut yeah, it, it sounds very footballers wives to me yeah 
Oh, that there we go. Exactly. You've got them side okay. by side in the book. Charlie's holding the book up, now, to, which is wonderful if, for if, our if, listeners. If, but. if there is any reason at all to buy this beautiful book, other than the fact that it's a fantastic book, it is to judge for yourself whether you think the hot pink damask and leopard print combo is a winner. Because personally, mm-hmm. I think leopard print is a neutral and it goes with everything. Do you know so what, I as well, it. your logo, Miss Restoration Cake, has <laughs> leopard print and that colour, doesn't it? Pretty much. I mean, it yeah. is. Oh, there you go. It's a winner then. It's classic. It's chic. It says, here I am, baby. It's it's gorgeous. And I love yeah. that. I love that she was so bold because, again, I think we, we think of the Victorians and we think of, you know, Victorian attitudes and you know, everything being very straight laced. Mm. The colours that you've included in the, the middle section of the book where you actually print the swatches. So it's not just a book telling us about the swatches. We mm. get to see them. Mm. It really dispels that image. It does. It does. And they are, um, you know, there's just endless, endless different combinations. I'm guessing she would have worn, did she talk about things like underwear and corsets and stuff like that? She doesn't, actually. There are things like, occasionally she includes pieces of lace that are trimmed a handkerchief or something like that. That's as close as we get. They're all outer garments. So there isn't really, uh, there isn't really any indication about what was what was happening beneath and with quite a lot of the research it is about reading between the lines you know you get a certain amount she doesn't give us give us very much and so there's a lot of kind of reading between the lines and and uh knowing that she would have been wearing a corset she would have um she would have had all of those under layers um but she's, she's interested not, in preserving the yeah top. she's not putting that in the diary but you um you reference in fact one of my one of my favourite women ever to have walked this earth um, when talking about undergarments and smocks, and you you mentioned Barbara Villiers, uh, lover of Charles II, and her little um, little prank on him when he comes back from getting married. She has all of her undergarments hung out in the privy gardens for him and his new wife basically to have walk past and have a look at. Amazing. I love but her. it's a show of her status as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And lace, I suppose lace is one of those fabrics that kind of occupies, a, um, it's a, it crosses the boundary really because you can wear it as a as trimming undergarments but also as a way of, of trimming outerwear as well. Carolyn, anything else you want to ask? So many questions. <laughs> I actually would, would like to return to the leopard print and damask, if you don't mind. I'm curious, you talk about how conventional she was when she moved back. Do you think there's a sense of her being conventional while in Singapore, that that was what the fashion was in Singapore, and so they were being conventional to the space they were occupying rather than being sort of bold? It could, it could well be. I think uh, the, that trying to find records of women in that space at that time was very difficult. You know, all the records are about um, the men building civic buildings and all of that kind of thing. Always, but, um, always, the husband. always, <laughs> always the husband. And we ran on International Women's Day. Yes, brilliant that we're doing that. So I think you could be right. I think maybe she has that, and and maybe she sees dress and textiles as that kind of offering that chameleon like quality where you can you can inhabit things that are that suit where you are and there are some uh, there was one uh one of the people in the book Maria Balestia who was an American who was living in Singapore at that time she does talk about learning how to dress her hair differently for example to suit the the climate so I think there were probably as you'd been there for a while you started to learn strategies to make it more bearable to live in that kind of climate when you come from the north of England so maybe that room with the leopard print and the cerise pink she was like that was only for when guests were around and she's like I can't even look at it it's disgusting yeah perhaps she, yeah maybe she absolutely loathed it and everyone else is saying no honestly trust me it's good <laughs> I love that and you know you make the point in the book about fashion history and the way that, that sometimes we you know I say we the the royal general we um we look at fashion as being frivolous and silly and you know a, a woman keeping bits of her clothes it's all very it's all very very you know not important mm. but in fact what 
what we've got here is a real insight into how people want to move through the world, how they want to be mm. seen or how they feel they need to be seen. Exactly. And I'm sure Carolyn will um, attest to this. I think dress history is, has really had to fight for its place in the in the canon of academia, really, because it often is um, dismissed as being the kind of um, very much the superficial side of, of historical inquiry. Um, but it's so central to so many things. And and I think the fact that this very nearly didn't survive is precisely because it would have been seen as just some sort of curiosity put together by a woman for a, you know, a, having a, a lark, you know, as a hobby. And that it wasn't, it wouldn't have been the kind of object considered a serious endeavour, really. Um, and so, yeah, it could easily have been cut up or chucked away or it, it's just serendipity that it didn't. But precisely for that reason, because I think often fashion is seen as just that kind of much less serious side of, of academic study. I've got to ask what's going to become of the book. And also as a follow up, can Carolyn touch it at some point? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to to bring it and show it to Carolyn and yeah let's let's nerd out over the the pages um I think ultimately it will go to a museum but I can't part with it quite yet oh no no just still... put it in your will it's fine yeah no, I'll leave it to someone it away. someone yeah. who'll do who will do it justice but there's still still so much I, well just like the miss the miss Garnet we talked a lot about miss Garnet today but um you know, I think there are still many aspects of it that that are yet to be um, yet to be uncovered. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep going for a while. Absolutely. As um, you should. As you should. Please keep mining that because we need more on it. Yes. Brilliant. Kate, thank you so much for coming on to discuss this book with us. Tell everybody again what it's called. It's The Dress Diary of Mrs. Anne Sykes and it's Secrets from a Victorian Woman's Wardrobe. So, yeah, hope you enjoy. Yes, do go buy a copy. We will endeavour to put it in the History Hack bookshop as well. But thank you so much. This has been delightful. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book. <laughs>